Uh, good afternoon and uh, welcome uh, to today's Grand Rounds presentation. Um, as uh, I usually do, I'd like to remind you to fill out the attendance record and also the program evaluation and if you could give the CME committee any ideas that you might have in regards to future topics or future speakers, we always appreciate that. A uh, reminder that uh, next week there will be no Grand Rounds next Wednesday and then we'll, uh, we'll reconvene in two weeks. Uh, today, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Grant Goldsberry. Uh, Dr. Goldsberry is board certified in radiology. He did his training at the University of Iowa and then the University of South Carolina. Uh, he is a member of the radiology department here at Mary Greeley and at McFarland. And uh, he's here today to update us on some uh, interesting uh, new developments in breast imaging. And uh, please join me in uh, welcoming Dr. Go uh, Goldsberry. Okay, thanks everybody. Um, uh, I'm gonna kind of do a general overview of kind of the, all the changes that are currently occurring in breast imaging, the new studies that we're implementing here in Ames, and then also um, kind of a, a lot of the time we'll be addressing uh, some of the controversies in breast imaging uh, currently. Um, I have a lot of data in the presentation which may get boring and tedious to a certain extent, but I think it's important to understand what the data shows us and how that in some cases contradicts what the recommendations uh, that have been made by uh, some of the uh, uh, committees. Uh, no disclosures. Uh, so kind of some key questions that I'll try to uh, address today. Uh, first of all, mammography, obviously the, the end goal is to uh, potentially cure patients of breast cancer. So if we're saving lives, it's kind of a key uh, portion of, of what we're trying to accomplish. Um, other key question that we often um, uh, get feedback from is, well, who do I screen? Which, with what modality? How long do I screen? What is all this new stuff about 3D mammography? And then what about harms of mammography? Are we causing too many harms and not benefiting enough patients? This is uh, just a slide to uh, show you um, just kind of average sizes of cancers. Um, it takes a cancer to be uh, at least two to two and a half centimeters to be typically found on a, a breast examination, uh, while with 2D mammography, uh, the average size of a, a cancer that we're finding on that is about half the size. And why is that important? Um, statistically, uh, the size of the cancer at the time of diagnosis has uh, a significant prognostic um, uh, implications. Um, cancers that are one centimeter have an approximate 10% 10, 10 chance of having uh, lymph node involvement. And then as you increase in size, if you get up to the two centimeter, which again is kind of a typical size for um, what you detect on a clinical breast exam, you can see that the chance of having lymph node involvement is significantly higher. And as the cancer continues to get uh, larger, it further increases the chance of having lymph node involvement. And again, if you can catch the cancers before they spread to lymph nodes, the, the treatment regimens that we currently have are um, much more effective. Uh, this slide just gives a general overview of um, uh, the incidence rate of both what we'd call invasive cancers and then your, your in insight to the DCIS uh, type lesions. Um, and as you can see, um, uh, with some of the recommendations that have come out from the United States Preventive Task Services Force where their recommendation was to start screening at 50, um, if you look at this chart, there's no point where, you know, at age 50 there's a sharp um, upward angle of these curves. It really is a curve that really starts uh, beginning um, within the late 30s or at age 40. Um, and you can see some of the, um, the cancer lines trending off as you get into the very older age group. That's probably a little bit of a statistical anomaly. Uh, we find fewer cancers in that age group, but that tends to be the age where uh, maybe patients have other disease processes that um, whether you find a breast cancer or not maybe isn't all that important. So I think this line really would continue to go up, but it's just that not as many women in that age group have uh, the mammography screening studies. And we'll kind of address that as well today. Wh how long do I screen? And when do I start screening? All those types of questions. Um, this is uh, just another kind of a numerical uh, view of, of basically the previous slide. Uh, but it's an important thing in, in that how many cancers do we typically detect per every thousand 
women that we screen for breast cancer. And again, this just kind of is a numerical um, uh, overview that again, cancer detection is obviously the lowest in younger age group and the highest in the older age group. With most cancers, age is one of the strongest predictors. The older we are, the more likely we are to have cancers, whether it's breast cancer or any other cancers. Um, but again, the point I want to make is that there's no magical demarcation at age 50 that suddenly um, the cancer risk is dramatically higher than it is in the 40 to 40, uh, 49-year-old group. As you can see, between the 45 to 49 and the 50 to 54, there's a slight increase in the, the cancer detection rate, but it's not a dramatic uh, difference. So we'll go into the, um, the previous United States Preventive Services Task Force. Um, recommendations came out in 2002, and then the updated ones came out in 2009. And the recommendations changed pretty dramatically between those, those two time points. Um, what, the, what this um, task force looked at, they looked at all the randomized controlled trials in uh, breast imaging uh, up to that point. There are eight, eight total studies that they uh, looked at. One of them they excluded just because they th didn't think it was a high enough quality study, so they included seven studies in their meta-analysis. And at that time, they recommended either annual or biennial um, uh, screening mammography starting at age 40. Um, between 2002 and 2009, there was one additional randomized controlled trial that they looked at. Um, so there's one additional um, uh, kind of data set that they uh, took a look at. This is a, a British trial. Um, it initially, at their initial screening, they used the two-view mammography, uh, but then at their subsequent follow-up, they only used a single projection uh, mammography, and it was not digital mammography at that time. It was just the screen film mam mammography. Um, and they started at age 39 to 41 and, and followed them up to age 48. Interesting thing is they found um, a 24% reduction in mortality. They considered it statistically insignificant because the, the confidence interval went from 0.5 to 1.01. .01. So anytime you hit the one, um, they say that that's not a statistically significant uh, reduction, but a lot of that just is attributable to the power of the study um, overall. So that's the only new data that this task force examined between the two. The updated recommendations changed to uh, recommending uh, every two-year mammogram starting at age 50 and no mammograms between age 40 and 49. Uh, the key question I'm going to try to address today to start with is why have a majority of the medical societies uh, strongly disagreed with this, including both from the radiology side, from the surgical side, from the oncology side. All those groups, groups have come out uh, strongly against these recommendations and continue to recommend screening starting at age 40. Uh, one of the most important factors is that tumors in younger women uh, are more aggressive. They demonstrate faster growth and quicker spread to lymph nodes. You may ask, why is that? Um, some of the theories that have been hypothesized are that women, obviously younger women, have more hormonal influences on the breast. Uh, so we think that has at least a portion, uh, uh, a portion of the pie as to why these tumors uh, just are more aggressive. Um, the data that the task force looked at demonstrated a mor mortality benefit. So we're saving patient's lives by doing mammography from age 39 to age 69. So those are kind of two key reasons why a majority of groups have disagreed. This actually breaks it down by decades. Um, the task force own data that they looked at showed a 15% mortality reduction for women uh, in the 40s, 14% mortality reduction in age 50s, and a 32% reduction in the 60s. So as you can see, they actually showed a slightly higher mortality benefit from screening patients in the 40s as opposed to the 50s. And then over age 70, uh, most of the randomized trials just didn't have enough patients um, in that age group to, to reliably come up with a recommendation. Um, again, as I mentioned before, uh, this task force only looked at uh, randomized controlled studies. Um, and this is kind of the, the classic um, type of study that you want to look at to see if there's true benefit. Drug studies, things like that, have a patient takes drug A, uh, other group doesn't take drug A, is there a benefit or not? 
In theory, that would be great for mammography, but the problem you have with mammography um, studies is you, in, you invite a certain segment of the population to participate in the study. So, you know, say there's 100 people on the west side of Ames and 100 people on the east side of Ames. The people on the west side, you say, you 100, we're going to invite you to participate in our study. The other 100, we're not going to invite you to participate in the study. Well, say 75 out of those 100 that were invited actually participate in the study. You have 25 of those people that aren't participating in the study, but that data from that population is still included in the study. The other people that you didn't invite, they still could potentially go get mammograms outside of the study, um, and that would be uh, affected in kind of comparing the two groups. So you don't get these clean breaks between the two groups that you do with drug studies and things like that. So you get basically what we call contamination of your results, or the, the basic end game is that it, controlled studies in this type of setting are going to underestimate the benefits um, of mammography. Uh, one of the bigger studies that's come up in the uh, recent media has been this uh, Canadian National Breast Cancer uh, Screening Study. This study was started uh, decades ago, and they kind of the initial analysis of the data started in the, in the 90s, and then they've updated it um, further with more recent examination of the data. Uh, the problems that were that have been addressed basically for decades now was um, even the, the study acknowledged that their initial mam mammography images that they're acquiring were poor. Um, and what they did is halfway through the study, they actually changed a little bit how they're doing the mammogram studies. Um, but you've got this whole segment of data in there that's um, going to be suboptimal just because of the quality of the study. Uh, they also had significant um, issues with true blinded enrollment of patients into the two groups. Um, uh, they were basically um, assigning patients to the mammography arm that had already palpable cancers and other uh, issues along those lines. Part of the data analysis showed that um, I think it was 60% of the mam mammographically detected cancers in the study were palpable cancers, which uh, kind of the general data in my own personal experience is the cancers that you're detecting on mammography, the percentage of their palpable at the time of mammographic identification is significantly lower than a 60% rate. Uh, the, this task force actually um, utilized kind of a modeling uh, of the data to uh, come up with mortality risks. Um, for each particular decade and overall kind of mortality benefit. So again, this is the data that this task force used to come up with their recommendations. So again, kind of go through why uh, I personally and many others disagree with the recommendations they've made. Key thing is obviously mortality reduction and then how many years of, of life are we saving in, in particular uh, segments. So as you can see, if you start screening at age 40 and continue through age 84, that provides the greatest mortality benefit of mammography. It almost reaches 40%. Um, if you come down a little bit lower um, to the 50 to 84 group, um, the mortality reduction drops from almost 40% to less than 30%. Other key thing is um, life years gained. Um, so obviously, even though there's fewer cancers detected in the, the younger age groups, they have a longer expected life expectancy. So diagnosing a cancer in a 40-year-old and curing a patient of cancer, they could easily live another 40 or 50 years, whereas you, if you diagnose a cancer in an 85-year-old, you may cure them of the breast cancer, but they may die from, from something else just because of the, the stage of life that they're in. Um, I'll have you uh, kind of... Keep this slide in, in mind as I go to the next slide. Um, this analysis was done on annual screening mammograms, where the next slide uh, will bring up um, every two-year mammograms. The key thing to look for is um, live save per 1,000 women screened um, is this column over here. And it, you'll see it's one life, one and a half lives for the youngest group. Um, kind of peaks in the 60 to 69 group and then starts to drop off as you get into the older age group. Key thing to watch is that as I jump to the next slide is you'll see all those numbers drop by going to um, an every two-year 
uh, time interval. Um, there's obviously financial considerations that go into any type of screening program. Obviously doing annual screening is going to be more expensive than, than the biennial screening, but that's not really the point that the, a lot of these recommendations are making. Uh, they claim that they're not looking at financial aspects, they're just looking at benefits, um, but I have a hard time believing based on the recommendations that a financial portion isn't involved with it uh, because the data just doesn't tend to support uh, the recommendations that they've made. So again, keep in mind here, as I go to the next one, you can see in that 40 to 49 age group, you go from 1.4 down to one life saved, and basically all of the other columns drop with the exception of the 8884 group, that went from 0 0.76 to 0 0.75, so basically the, the same, same in that age group. Again, I've kind of um, uh, brought this up. In, in general, the data is lacking on really what the true benefit is in the older age group. Um, just because there aren't enough randomized controlled trials in that age group. I think the key question, though, is when you should stop screening is basically if you found a cancer in that patient, would you not treat it? If you wouldn't treat the cancer, then you probably shouldn't screen for it. Um, kind of a statistic I saw recently is that a, a female in the U.S. reaches age 80. Um, the average life expectancy at that point it can be in another 8 to 10 years. So if you look at, you know, the top quartile, the healthiest of that 80-year-old group, they potentially could have a significantly longer life expectancy at that point. So I think in that particular age group, if you have a healthy 80-year-old, I think there's still benefit to screening. But if you have a relatively unhealthy 80-year-old um, that you'd never treat a breast cancer if you found it anyway, then, then there basically is no real point in screening at that point. Um, part of the, um, some of the objections that people have made to the, uh, the randomized controlled trials is, again, the contamination that, uh, that is involved in those particular studies with this type of setup for mammography. So the other type of study is obviously an observational study. And there can always be certain biases that get introduced in an observational study, but I still think it's important to look at, you know, we've been doing mammography for quite some time, both in Europe and the U.S., uh, and basically, we've got enough data to look at what is the true um, expected number of lives that we'll save based on yearly screening, every other year screening, and every three-year screening. So again, if you look at this 40 to 49-year-old age group, screening every year, your expected uh, number of lives saved would be 36% of people that are diagnosed with the breast cancer. So almost 4 out of 10 women um, uh, that are screened potentially could be saved. If you go to biennial screening, that drops to 18% in that youngest group. And then if you go to every three years, it drops down to 4%. Well, the recommendations are even worse than any of these scenarios. They're just saying don't screen at all. Um, but again, the cancers are the fastest growing in that age group. So you're going to have the most benefit from the annual screening just because if you wait longer, the tumors are going to have more time to get bigger. Um, and again, when you get out to the 50 to 59 and the 60 to 69 groups, you still have a mortality benefit from screening every year. Again, people could make a financial argument that maybe the amount of money you spend isn't worth saving the 5% extra lives. Um, that's, that's kind of a bigger argument than I can make as a basically looking at the science of it. That needs to be basically a whole society discussion on how much money do we want to save for, uh, how much money do we want to spend for particular screening programs. But the data is very clear that the most benefit you're going to get is from annual screening mammograms. Uh, one of the other uh, I issues that people often bring up is are we diagnosing cancers that would just kind of sit there and hang out and never actually cause um, any problems for the patient. There certainly um, is a component to that. Uh, there's the ductal carcinoma in situ, uh, which there's clearly some of those cases that if you never found them, the patient would never know, that, know they're there and never have any adverse outcomes uh, from that. This is one of the better studies that I've seen that kind of looks at um, how much overdiagnosis is there. Many of the other studies, um, uh, I think, overestimate uh, what the, the number of cancers are that we're detecting that uh, wouldn't have any kind of adverse outcome for an individual patient. Basically, um, 
what this um, discusses is the kind of the first bullet point I have on here is when somebody comes in for their baseline mammogram, and then the second line is when patients come in for subsequent mammograms. So kind of the key thing is, is on initial screening mammogram, obviously we're going to have the highest chance of picking up cancers that maybe wouldn't progress because uh, you would think that those cancers have probably been in the woman's breast. Um, they would just stay there in the breast, never spread anywhere else in the body. Uh, this, this particular paper has estimated that of the ductal carcinoma cases that we detect on initial screening mammogram, uh, approximately a third of those would probably be what we consider non-progressive, i.e. they would never uh, develop into a full-fledged breast cancer. But still, when you group the invasive cancers, which obviously will spread if you give enough time with the ductal carcinoma in situ cases, there's still a 19 times greater chance of us detecting a cancer that would have clinical relevance um, as opposed to those cancers that we're detecting that would not have that. Once you get into the subsequent screening mammograms, that percentage of non-progressive DCIS drops even further. So it's a pretty small portion at that point, estimated at only 4 to 5 percent range. Uh, one of the bigger things that you'll hear in the news and one of the bigger things that's kind of changing for mammography is why does mammography not catch all cancers? And the number one most important factor is breast density. Um, you can see the, uh, the uh, breast cancer detection rates based on breast density. So when you take the least dense, compare it to the most dense, we're picking up 80% of cancers in the least dense and only 30% in the most dense. So what can we do to address this issue? Um, breast density, it's an independent risk factor for breast cancer, and I've got uh, kind of the four different categories. Um, so over here, this is going to be your category A, which is considered the least dense, and as you progress across here, this is A, B, C, and D. So D is obviously the most dense. Um, cancers on mammography show up as kind of white masses. So if you look at these particular examples, you have, in the least dense, you have a kind of a gray-black background, so you can obviously expect when you put a white mass on a gray or black background, it's going to be much easier to detect that. If you move all the way across to the most dense, if you put a white mass on a white background, the, the cancer is obviously going to have to get to a larger size before it's uh, visibly detectable on mammography. Uh, this, uh, this study kind of looked at what is the true um, relative risk of breast cancer as you progress uh, from the least dense to the most dense. So basically what they've taken is the the 5% of women that have the least breasts, uh, least dense breasts, and then compared them to the category A, B, C, and D, which again, D being the, the, the most dense. And as you can see, when you compare the two extremes, you have a four and a half time higher risk of getting breast cancer in women that have the most uh, dense breasts. So you have the highest risk, yet at the same time, we have the worst chance of detecting it on mammography, which is obviously not a situation we want to be in. Um, basically, age and whether a patient has the BRCA gene, which is kind of considered the breast cancer um, a gene, those are the only two factors that have a higher risk of um, uh, development of breast cancer uh, when compared with breast density. Family history actually is less important than breast density is for the risk of developing breast cancer. And since 40% of women fall into the C and D categories, uh, when you compare that with the percent of the population that has the BRCA gene, that's such a smaller portion of the population that um, breast density actually has a higher attributable risk or just because there's more women with dense breasts, that's results in, that risk results in more cancers than the BRCA status does. So the two key questions, how do we improve detection in women that have the most dense, and how can we potentially decrease the harms of screening mammography? Um, what I'm going to show you here is just a, a quick video that kind of shows the, the 3D uh, tomosynthesis uh, device that we're installing uh, here at the clinic. Selenia Dimensions is the next generation of our Selenia digital mammography system. It enables you to capture both 2D mammograms and 3D tomosynthesis images using one platform. 
The gantry and C arm are sensitively designed with ergonomic features that maximize ease of use for the mammographer and minimize discomfort for the patient. The system is designed to perform mammography exams using either 2D or 3D, or both in one compression. To perform tomosynthesis, the imaging arm moves in an arc above the breast, quickly taking a series of very low dose images. Using this initial data set, a sophisticated computer program now back projects the visual detail into three-dimensional space, building a synthetic tomogram in one millimeter slices. This is an extremely intensive computational process, but Selenia Dimensions performs it in a matter of seconds. So the mammographer can preview the 3D sequence right away while the patient is still there. Once the exam is finished, she can forward the study digitally to the radiologist, who may be across the hall or across the country. The radiologist can examine both 2D and 3D studies with an upgraded Secure View Diagnostic Workstation. Now, instead of viewing all the tissues at a glance, the physician can move through the tissue layer by layer, clearly revealing details that might otherwise be obscure. Selenia Dimensions, a revolutionary new tool in the fight against breast cancer. Uh, so, so as you can see, the actual kind of what the patient experience for 3D versus 2D mammography, it's not a whole lot different. Um, the breasts are still compressed, um, kind of the views you take are the similar type of projections. It's just that the arm acquires kind of images over an arc rather than just one single slice image. Um, 3D mammography has been shown that it detects more cancers, more invasive cancers, and then has the potential to decrease recall rates as well. Um, just because with a, with a 2D mammogram, you're obviously taking a three-dimensional breast and compressing it all down onto a two-dimensional image. You can get overlap of breast tissue that can look like a pseudo mass, basically, and that's why we get so many recalls. This has the potential where you can kind of scroll through the different layers of the breast um, and it can uh, potentially help us separate out those pseudo masses from true masses in the breast. Uh, other key thing uh, with uh, 3D mammography, um, kind of on the, uh, this, this part of the curve would be the kind of the perfect ideal world where you only detect true cancers, never biopsy things that aren't cancers. Obviously, we're never going to get to that point. Um, but if you compare this, this lower curve is kind of where we're at with um, 2D mammography. And then this top curve is where we are with 3D mammography. So what it does for individual radiologists is it makes us just more accurate in our interpretations. Uh, where we can potentially have fewer kind of uh, biopsies that are performed for um, uh, things that aren't don't turn out to be cancers and the other potential benefit would be just the number of recalls that we have for patients needing to come back for extra images. Uh, one of the other key things um, with uh, the tomosynthesis images or the 3D images, um, because you're, you're acquiring multiple, uh, multiple images, um, the it, actual individual dosage of each of those images is significantly less than the conventional 2D mammograms. Um, but what this um, graph is informative for us is this is kind of Hologic, which is the vendor we're using for tomosynthesis. This is the dosing for just a standard 2D mammography. And if you look over to this column, this is what we would see with 2D mammograms plus doing the tomosynthesis imaging, which is what most places have been doing up until recently. What we're now able to do is what this uh, final column shows us. And basically what that allows us to do is just create the, the 3D mammogram or acquire just the 3D mammogram images and then taking that data and actually reconstructing our conventional 2D mammogram images. And as you can see, if you compare kind of the first column to this last column, there's only a very slight increase in the radiation dose um, to the breast from, from this new technique. So we're getting the benefits of the 3D mammography, which without sacrificing much uh, for the radiation dose. It's only a minimal increase. 
this just kind of uh, outlines what's the risk from um, the radiation that you receive from a mammogram. It's a very, very, very tiny theoretical risk of actually causing breast cancer from, from uh, mammography. Uh, the other uh, new item that we've uh, brought to, to AIMS is uh, screening automated whole breast ultrasound. And again, that's the most beneficial for women that are in those last two categories. So again, A was the least dense and D was the most dense. So the screening breast ultrasound is uh, targeted to those groups that are in the most dense uh, categories. And this is basically should be treated, it's not a replacement for mammography. We still recommend all women get mammography relative, uh, regardless of their breast density. But this is a complementary or supplementary study um, that should be considered just, you, you get your automated breast ultrasound with your mammogram on a yearly basis. And now I'll uh, just kind of briefly show you again another uh, video presentation just regarding the equipment and how it operates. Sonocine automated whole breast ultrasound, known as Sonocine Abbas, has been cleared by the FDA as an adjunct to screening mammography. This technology was invented and engineered specifically for the purpose of providing physicians with a workflow optimized, time efficient, systematic examination for early detection of mammographically occult breast cancers in women with BIRAD 3 and 4 breast densities and in women with implants. Sonocine Abbas is an accessory to your existing ultrasound system. The Sonocine scanning and review technology can be configured to operate with all state-of-the-art diagnostic ultrasound imaging systems. If you choose to upgrade or change your ultrasound system, Sonocine Abbas will configure to the new system as well. To prepare your ultrasound system for the examination, we connect it to the Sonocine acquisition station, and your transducer is attached to Sonocine's robotic scanning arm. This allows Sonocine to capture and store high-resolution 2D images controlled by the position and movements of the robotic scanning arm. Sonocine Abbas does not require a dedicated room. When Sonocine examinations are not being performed, your ultrasound system is free for other uses. The Sonocine Abbas examination is managed from a touchscreen graphical user interface, which is designed to reduce operator error and facilitate workflow. The patient wears a combination of a custom-designed camisole and a patented hydrogel nipple pad. The nipple pad eliminates possible nipple artifacts and protects the nipple to avoid discomfort during the scan. The camisole becomes acoustically transparent when impregnated with gel. It holds the breasts in a desired scanning position, allows for consistent transducer contact, and provides a level of privacy for the patient. Sonocine Abbas is an automated and computer-guided examination of the whole breast, including the lower axillary lymph nodes, the infraclavicular, far medial, and inframammary areas. Sonocine covers all breast tissue by scanning in linear overlapping rows from the axilla to the sternum. The technologist does not move the transducer along its path. The system drives the transducer while the technologist maintains its angle and contact pressure. The Sonocine robotic arm controls the position and speed with which the transducer is moving over the skin and adapts to the curvature of the breast to maintain linear scanning rows. The system also controls the rate at which the ultrasound images are acquired and stored. This allows the Sonocine system to adapt to scanners with different capabilities and optimize the performance so that if a scanner produces images at a faster rate, Sonocine Abba scans at a faster rate as well. Because the Sonocine image acquisition is automated and quality controlled, a technologist or staff member of your choice can perform the examination. No additional accreditation is required. This allows the radiologist to review the study at a convenient time without patient distractions, as patient presence is not required. The reading software can be installed on your existing reading station. The complete Sonocine study, as well as individual images with annotations, can be stored to and retrieved from your PACs. One of the most important features of the Sonocine Abbas technology is that the system is designed to maximize lesion visualization and detectability by presenting the recorded images to the radiologist 
in a variable frame rate, easy to navigate CINE format. This creates a level of lesion conspicuity, especially for invasive cancers, which is simply not achievable with any static review system. The Sonocine Office technology provides the radiologist with a reproducible, fully documented, and quality controlled adjunctive whole breast screening examination. Yeah, so this is kind of some early data on adding the breast ultrasound system on top of mammography. Um, this particular study, just for a, another vendor's device, found uh, approximately three cancers for every thousand screened women um, that were not visualized on, on mammography. Uh, there's a group down in Arkansas that has the same um, machine that we've actually uh, uh, just started using here. They actually found a little bit higher detection rates. Um, if you extrapolate their data out, it's almost 10 out of a thousand uh, mammographically undetected cancers that they're identifying. And this is just a particular example from another institution. So again, this woman has uh, very dense breast tissue. Um, there's no clear mass identifiable on the, on the mammogram images. But then if we move to the, the, uh, the Sonocine or the automated breast ultrasound images, um, the kind of the, the grays and whites on the image, and that's kind of the normal breast parenchyma. And then if you see this black kind of irregularly marginated, uh, mass, that's the cancer that's only visible. And again, that cancer is probably on the mammogram, but it's just surrounded by breast tissue that's the same density, so it makes it not apparent on those images. Uh, other question that often um, gets brought up is, well, we've got the breast density, we've got screening ultrasound, we've got mammography, how does MRI uh, play into this whole, uh, whole the issue of, of screening? Basically, um, MRI is uh, limited to a very selected group. Um, the key factors are if you have the BRCA gene, and um, that's somebody that should undergo annual screening uh, MRI. Um, and the other thing which we've started to utilize on our mammography reports is using the Gale risk model, or there's other similar models out there that um, basically aim to get at the same endpoint of estimating lifetime risk based on um, family history. And what the key catch is, is anybody that has a greater than 20% uh, calculated lifetime risk of breast cancer, that's another group of patients that would benefit from um, uh, getting the annual screening breast MRI. So we've started including that on our reports. Um, you, you should see a calculated risk at the bottom of the reports. And again, if we see a 20% or greater risk, those would be the patients that we'd uh, recommend. There's a couple other kind of caveats. If patients have had prior radiation therapy, and then there's several other um, syndromes that uh, potentially would benefit from screening breast MRI as well. One key factor, though, um, breast density is not included in the Gale risk model currently. So it's mainly a family history risk, but it does not uh, include breast density. So uh, as I pointed out throughout this talk, breast density is a significant risk fa factor for the development of breast cancer. So you can't rely just on the Gale risk model at this time because that does not include the breast density um, risk. Uh, I predict probably in the future, breast density will be incorporated into our risk tools, but currently is not, uh, not factored into that. And I want to make sure I left time for any questions that people may have. Yeah, that's, that's a good question. Again, it's uh, kind of what, what is the insurance coverage for, for mammography, the 3D mammography and the screening breast ultrasound. Um, screening breast ultrasound, it's, it's a very state-specific um, coverage. There's um, certain states, Connecticut was the first one that mandated, um, basically, uh, they mandated first um, notifying women of their breast density and then subsequently um, have 
made it so that insurance companies have to cover the breast ultrasound. That's currently not the case in Iowa. There is no breast density notification law, and there's no requirement that insurance companies have to cover the, the ultrasound. Um, what we've done is we've uh, started doing this over the past month or two. We, don't, we haven't gotten definitive feedback from insurance companies yet, but um, kind of the preliminary uh, response we've gotten back is if the radiologist uh, mentions the breast density in the report and makes a recommendation to consider this, that they're at least kind of moving through the insurance company uh, pyramid. Uh, uh, so what we're, we're still waiting for a definitive answer on that, if it'll be covered, and there may be some variability between different insurance companies. Um, what we've been doing currently is um, uh, screening patients uh, with no basically financial risk to them if if the initial patients that we're screening, if it turns out the insurance companies won't pay, we're just going to cover those costs initially. Uh, we're hopeful that the insurance companies will cover it. Um, if not, then we'll have to kind of make a decision at that point. 3D mammography, um, most places that have done 3D mammography um, have basically, um, uh, I don't know if you want to call it an upcharge or what, but a lot of places have made patients pay 40 or $50 out of pocket to get the 3D mammography instead of the 2D mammography. My expectation is that will change in January because they've actually approved a specific code to bill for 3D mammography that they've never had before. So my expectation would be in starting in January that insurance companies will start kind of fully covering uh, 3D mammography at that time. What is the uh, cost for the, these uh, procedures? Um, the breast ultrasound, uh, the general cost is going to be about $400 is what will be billed to the insurance companies. And then, Deb, do you know the charge for the TOMO? Okay, so $380 or so for the, for the 3D MAMO. So both of them would be in similar ballpark. Yeah, so that's, again, that's the, it's kind of a global charge, and then what we actually get reimbursed from the insurance companies usually is significantly less than that charge, too. Yeah, currently, we've act we have actually have our first uh, 3D mammography unit installed. We're just waiting for the state approval, the state because uh, mammography is very regulated, so you have to get official approvals before you can start. Um, currently, what we're doing is just 2D mammograms. Uh, currently, what we're going to be doing in the future is, um, again, it kind of points back to the, the radiation issue. The biggest issue I had with 3D mammography was you're basically, previously, you're doubling the radiation dose for the study. Now, with the new technology they have, basically you just acquire 3D mammogram images and you recreate the 2D mammograms. So you're taking that 3D data and recreating the 2D data. So we'll have both, actually. We'll have the 3D images and the two-dimensional images to look at. And again, it's only a very slight increase in the radiation exposure to the women uh, for significantly more data for us to look at. Yeah, sorry. Yep, yep. So that's the, the, the other uh, piece that we're installing um, on, the, on the clinic side is we'll actually have an automated uh, computer algorithm as part of our tomosynthesis units that will actually uh, calculate the breast density and categorize it in that A through D. Currently, we're using just kind of a subjective radiology interpretation of which category do they fall into. Most of the time, that's pretty good, but there's going to be certain variability between radiologists and then even day-to-day -day our interpretation. So it's, it'll just help standardize that. And so it's basically those C to D categories, those top uh, most densely, um, the women that have the most dense breast tissue, those will be the two categories that will be recommending the screening ultrasound to go along with the, the 3D mammography. Have any, uh, have any cost-benefit analysis been done on the fact that this increases tremendously the number of uh, biopsies being done. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that is a that is a significant factor because um, 3D mammography just by itself it's a more expensive study to to perform, um, and then basically the issue we're running into with both 
the breast ultrasound and the 3D mammography is they're too new to really do those full kind of cost modeling of what the, what the cost is. Um, basically, what people have generally used is they've come up with kind of a $100,000 cost per life saved as being what people consider reasonable, like seat belts, I think it costs forty or fifty thousand dollars per life saved for seat belts, and mammography has been kind of in that general ballpark, the forty to fifty thousand dollar ballpark. So we'll have to see in the future if uh, the added imaging studies we're doing if it saves enough lives to make it make the cost worthwhile. And again, that's kind of a, a societal decision that we have to make. Yep. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's something we're intending to improve on. I don't know if you heard that question, but it's why can't the mammographers tell the patients um, what their kind of breast density category is? Right now, until we get the, the, the automated um, analysis of the breast density, they rely on the radiologist's interpretation. So we have to categorize the breast density before the mammographer can tell the patient. Once we have the automated um, calculation, that'll be immediately displayed to the technologist, so they will be able to inform the patients at that time what their breast density is. Do you think that being you know, asked to come back every six months request uh, 3D imaging at the next visit? Yeah, I mean, but. I think if they're asked, asking in the last two years to, to come every six months to have it rechecked, would that be a candidate like for the next, um, you know, could a patient just request the 3D imaging? Sure, yeah, it's, um, you can, uh, there's different aims. You can, in theory, use the 3D mammography for both kind of screening and kind of a diagnostic workup potentially too. Um, but basically that's, we're, since we're kind of just introducing this, there's gonna be uh, issues like that that come up where we'll have to kind of, uh, kind of merge people into our new imaging options. The good thing is though is we're, we'll have the 3D images but since we can kind of recreate 2D images, we can still compare 2D to 2D in the past. So the previous mammograms are all gonna be two-dimensional. We'll still have two-dimensional imaging to compare, but we'll have the additional information of having the 3D on top of it. Anything else? No? Okay, thank you.